Is there enough justice in our world? The obvious answer should be no. In our age where no one can be truly wrong according to what they believe, can there truly be a society that is relative? In this brief discussion, we take a look at the realities about the sense of right and wrong that we possess. This is Sit Down and Listen. Kant, a critiquer of religion, especially Christian thought, producing attacks to undermine those who defended classical Christianity, even Kant, in all of his agnosticism from a practical sense, in some of his final writings he wrote, we must live as if there is a God. Kant had taken God out of the equation from the theoretical idea, but at the same time, for all his attacks on God, he had to open the back door and let God in. It was a moral argument. There are so many people all over the world clamoring for justice to be served. The argument is this one. For ethics to be meaningful, there must be justice. Before any of us can say what we must or what we should do, we all have been guilty of uttering those words to someone we want to correct. When we want to help alter a behavior or help others understand our perspectives, we have all received rules and regulations. Kant says, before any of that can hold any relevance to our lives, for it to have true meaning, there must be justice. Why? Because if there is no justice, then why should we be concerned about doing what is right and doing what is wrong? Who cares? When we look around the world, we see clear examples of injustice being manifest. We see people who receive a reward who do not deserve it and people who suffer and are blamed even though they are innocent. So Kant continues his thought and asks, well, what would there have to exist to be for there to be justice? Well, there would have to be a judge. And that judge would have to be just, and that judge would have to be omnipotent, and he would have to be righteous himself. He would have to survive death. We would have to survive death so that we could go to a place where there is perfect justice. This continues, and by the time Kant is finished, he has constructed a very close picture of the Christian faith. With a God who is just, who promises a coming judgment, and holds every human life responsible for each decision taken. But it's important to remember Kant's mentality behind all of this. He says, that does not prove God exists. It only proves the necessity for the existence of God for ethics to have meaning. If somehow ethics are not meaningful, society ultimately becomes impossible. During the 19th century, the response to God being vanished and disproven made people who didn't want a religious commitment start throwing celebrations. Hats were being flung in the air. People were happy that they didn't have to deal with that cruel God that told them what they had to do and what they could not do. They had a freedom they had never experienced. Finally, no longer do we have to deal with teachers telling us how to live our lives. Finally, no more books to read or follow. Finally, no more looks by religious fanatics that expect me to live a certain way and do the things they do. Finally, no more Moses. No more Jesus. Finally, no more God. What I have always wanted is mine. The chance to make my own destiny. This was the good news of 19th century popular thought. Man is no longer accountable to God. And in the 20th century, it took an even more depressing turn. Man no longer counts. This is the logical degradation of thought. It makes sense for this social shift to occur. If we are not accountable for our lives, it means ultimately that our lives don't count. This is why right and wrong are so critical. They are signs that point to something greater than ourselves, at least a higher sense of purpose and meaning. But yet, the opinion that dominates our country nowadays is that there are no absolutes. 
This has been a time for moral revolution, where what we like and desire has taken center stage instead of a sense of duty and agendas that try to achieve preferential treatment and benefits have overtaken law. No one can tell me this isn't a problem when over 50% of the American population has a distrust towards the federal government. Washington DC has won the reputation as being a snake pit, a place where things don't get done. And this is just one area where morality has been blurred. A common cliche, you've heard it before, you can't legislate morality. And it comes up, and to me it means that just because you pass the law, that does not mean people's behaviors will change. But see, the meaning of this has been altered to mean that the federal government should not get involved in matters of morality. Morality has also become a relative matter. We fail to see that objective morality is more involved in our lives than what we think from the smallest actions, from how we drive our cars, following traffic laws, having respect for fellow drivers. This is a moral aspect. It leads us to the question, should we care for murder? Should we care about rape? Of course we do, because our society does not truly believe in a total moral relativity. Because our lives would become impossible and we should sit back and reflect on these things before we go out to the streets and say that everyone has a right to live their lives however they see fit. After saying that, if you understand the broad implications, you'll want to add parameters to that however. The truth is that all along the history of civilizations, cultures have been started with foundations of a philosophy, a religion, or a mythology. Some that provided unity and stability to these societies. In this country, we have gone all over all three of these. We started in a theological grounding based on the early pilgrims that arrived on the eastern coast of this land. But then in the 18th century, we moved over to a philosophical foundation. And as we speak, we are slowly descending to a mythological foundation. What does this mean? Well, it means that the basic foundation of the way we live our lives today is one on moral relativism. And in some aspects, it can be called a myth because like myths, this idea has no real correlation to objective truth. What I am proposing is that we are basing our civilization on something that can't possibly be true. This is why we can't really live with it. There is an internal warfare that is inevitable if we continue down this slope. There are many groups pulling the rope of relativity. There are many interests at the table. And we're in serious trouble. The idea of abortion is one that catches my attention. It is an issue that in terms of people who oppose it, it has been for the most part very non-violent. And this just goes to show that people don't really care about ethics. For people in other areas and decades, this would have provoked massive, massive upheaval and war. Friedrich Nietzsche, a German philosopher, had some things to say about ethics. He made a very interesting distinction between master morality and herd morality. When he spoke about the Ubermensch or the Superman to come down to start a new civilization, he was asking for someone who would have the courage to do whatever he wanted to do, to live by his own rules and standards. The character Nietzsche dreamt of was one of boldness that feared nothing. He didn't answer to anyone. Now, I am one who disagrees with these thoughts, but what's intriguing to me is his breakdown, is Nietzsche's breakdown of Europe during the 19th century. He said that as a main, as a whole, European civilization lived according to a herd morality. Do these words bring something to mind? Maybe the words of the prophet Isaiah, all like, all we like sheep have gone astray. Sheep, in many instances, don't think about their next steps when they are in a flock. A straight line does not exist. When one commits to a direction, the rest will follow. Sheep don't make ethical decisions or analyze what they'll do next. They go with the flow. And I don't know what better phrase to describe my generation than go with the flow. That's the American lifestyle. Be cool. You worry too much too often. This is the ethic that we possess. 
This is the result of people who do not carefully think about their view of God, about their view of the world, and about the lives that they have. We often become influenced mainly by the herd. And my question to you who are listening right now to my words, are you following the herd? Are you moving along your life waiting for those around you to make a move so that you can just simply react and without giving it much thought you follow? Will you decide to be a generation of moral courage? It doesn't matter what your convictions are, but are you willing to go against the herd to stand up for what is wrong? This is exactly what Christianity is about. As the people of God, we are to seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And that is a direct ethical order. And if our society doesn't believe in right or wrong, which isn't logical, no one in a relativistic culture is constant in that belief. Listen to me. The myth of moral relativism is an attempt to create a license to sin that is backed up by a broken view of ethics. This is where we stand. Where will you move on from here?